Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Unlimited Hangout. I'm your host, Whitney Webb. For the past several years, warnings about a damaging cyber attack that will cripple critical systems around the world have been steadily growing before becoming much more frequent in the past year or so. Part of this may be due to the focus of the World Economic Forum and its founder, Klaus Schwab, on the inevitability of such an event, as seen in their simulation last year entitled Cyber Polygon 2020. At last year's event, Schwab had ominously warned that a devastating cyber attack was not only in the cards, but that it would make the COVID-19 crisis look like a, quote, small disturbance, end quote, by comparison. Since then, the World Economic Forum has been involved in the creation of various reports in conjunction with the dominant players in the financial sector, including Wall Street banks, central banks, SWIFT, and others, that suggest this coming cyber attack will explicitly target supply chains and third-party providers of critical services. They further argue that those responsible for the attack will include at least one nation-state, with only U.S. adversaries listed as possibilities – that the attack will start off small in one part of the world and then crescendo into a global catastrophe, and that ransomware will be the most likely type of attack used to either instigate the event or deal the mortal blow. But even without a cyber attack, supply chains globally are already buckling, with warnings just this week that supply chains are, quote, imploding, along with recent statements from some of the largest companies in the world that prices are set to creep up for everything ranging from food to electronics. Little attention has been paid to the extreme disruptions in supply chains, particularly food supply chains, over the past year by anyone in independent media, save for pretty much one person, Christian Westbrook. And today I am lucky enough to be joined by Christian to discuss these topics and more. For those who may be unfamiliar, Christian is an agricultural researcher and founder of the Ice Age Farmer Broadcast, which occupies a very important niche in independent media by focusing on how the elite are targeting the global food supply, both in terms of the effort to mechanize and commodify the natural systems that have powered agriculture for millennia and the parallel effort to criminalize actual sustainable agriculture. So how's it going, Christian? It's going well. Thank you for having me, Whitney. Uh, You do phenomenal work, and it's a pleasure and honor to be here with you. Oh, well, I really appreciate that. Thanks. I think you also do phenomenal work that is really undercovered, and I really appreciate uh, your focus on this area that, uh, you know, most people have totally just glossed over, not just in the past year, but, you know, even before then. But uh, with that being said, we have a lot to get into today. So I wanted to start off first with a a discussion on the huge impact of COVID-related lockdowns and other policies on global supply chains, especially as it relates to the food supply. So uh, listeners uh, to this podcast may or may not remember that last May, there were tons of videos all over social media showing farmers destroying massive amounts of perfectly, perfectly good crops, all because, quote, coronavirus ravaged the food markets, as Business Insider put it at the time. So... How extensive have these disruptions to food supplies been since the COVID crisis began in earnest last March? And what can people expect to see in the short term in the absence of some massive new shock to the system? Yeah, they were substantial. And the problem is not so much that it was this one huge you know, shock to the system that's sending everything off the, the rails. Uh, it's that it's been a sustained series of blows that are mounting. And so we're experiencing sort of a cascading series of failures. Or actually, as you put it well in, in, uh, in your piece on the cyber pandemic, it would be a series of dominoes, one after another, that would continue to fall. Um, So you're right that a lot of people saw, and it was very uh, compelling images is why I think this got some press, uh, farmers dumping hundreds of thousands of gallons of milk during the early days of the pandemic, mountains of onions going to waste. Much of this was due to the fact that, you know, restaurants and schools were shut down. And so those farmers that relied on those distribution channels to get those products to market, suddenly there was there's no market there. Uh, And so that was was an initial shock. But again, it's it's more that uh, a lot of those channels have been closed. Um, and then that the supply chain itself has just been continually deteriorating since then. Um, a lot of f- declarations of force majeure where people just can't make delivery on their contracts, um, container shortages in the shipping industry. And that's really we're seeing that this is really where the uh, the stress lines are starting to appear in terms of the whole system starting to fracture. When um, when all of the world's trade and most of it is you know in this globalized system that they've stood up, Things have to get where they're going on the other side of the world. And it's, you know, a lot of the time when you look at the way things uh, are, are created or transported in the world, it's like they're grown in the U.S., but then they're sent over. In fact, this happens with animals. Animals are grown out in the U.S., 
and then sent over to China frozen to be processed and cut up and turned into other products. And then maybe even sent somewhere else for what they call value add, like maybe they fry and bread it up, but then send it back to American consumers. And the idea right. that this one piece of meat would go would go back and forth across the ocean just to get cooked, it's ridiculous, right? And so totally. when you have a when you have a system that's built upon that, that's predicated upon the free flow of goods on these ships back and forth. Um, and then you start to introduce interruptions both to that supply chain itself, but also to all the things that are feeding into it, you know, the agriculture. Um, now we've also seen the Texas grid going down. It's one of the, there's ports and there's a lot of petroleum and plastics production down there. So the plastics production is still shut down. And then, of course, the Suez Canal getting blocked a couple of weeks ago. It's these it's these serial attacks on the supply chain itself that are really starting to, in fact, are turning into uh, massive problems. And that immediately translates into drastically increased costs of shipping, this logistics costs. If you can even get containers at this point, you're paying, you know, five or six hundred percent of what you would have paid last year just to move those goods, which, as we just said, when the whole system is predicated upon this, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. So things are sort of grinding to a halt and we're really starting to see um, – uh, signs of that happening. At the same time, there is, and this is where my work has been focusing over the last few years, there is a now a crisis in terms of an acute grains shortage. And this has been a result both of the fact that the USDA has historically been underreporting losses and overreporting ending stocks, basically lying and saying we have more food than we have. Yeah. And um, and over the course of the last mm, six months now, they sort of started walking that back. We're now experiencing sort of a day of reckoning where they say, well, we really don't actually have the grains that we thought we had. And um, and in those six months, of course, the U.S. has been exporting hand over fist at record levels. And when I say record, I don't just mean like higher. I mean like uh, a year's worth historically of grain has gone out the door to China within a single week. And you can see these pictures, these satellite views of like the line of cargo ships going around from Brazil and Argentina to China. just They are just sucking up all of the substance of the world, trying to get grains, soybeans, corn, now wheat as well. They're, they're hoovering up uh, because they know what's coming. They see this commodity super cycle and, and just everything grinding to a halt, and they've been preparing for that. But the U.S. sadly has not. Uh, and so we're in a situation where that's why we're now seeing everyone starting to sort of appreciate, uh, especially now that South Africa's crop has, or sorry, South America's crop is really bad for grains, um, that uh, that this is an acute situation. There isn't some next crop of corn or soybeans com coming in that's going to be able to fix the entire situation. And that's why we're now seeing historic levels for corn and soybean prices. And so it's important to actually sort of keep track of both of these things as we have our conversation today. Yeah, so I, I think it's really important for people to keep in mind just how many decades in the making this crisis is. Um, one key policy for people that are interested in learning more about this um, that I encourage people to go and look up if you're not already aware uh, took place during the Nixon administration um, involving their <laughs> agriculture secretary, Earl Butts, uh, who basically implemented, uh, I guess, what's popularly known as get big or get out, basically this massive attack on on smaller family farms and uh, that basically created this uh, system we have today where most big farm, well, most farms in the U.S. are big, but they also depend on subsidies and just a, a, a series of, of systems and, and infrastructure that in a lot of cases doesn't make sense. And what you brought up about the processing aspect, how a lot of, you know, the raw materials may be grown in the U.S., but they're, you know, shipped to be processed abroad and then shipped back to the U.S. I mean, it's insane. Or then you have a bunch of you know, uh, for example, onions being grown in the U.S., they're being shipped to some other country. And then the U.S. is importing onions from Peru, uh, which when I lived in Kentucky, every onion in the supermarket came from Peru, even though <laughs> I lived like, a, you know, I had a neighbor that grew like, a, a, well, I lived by a, a farm that grew like, you know, a bunch of alliums and, and onions and stuff. So it was just really like silly, you know. Um, and, and, but I think a lot of people forget that just because um the system in the U.S., the grocery store system, uh, has distanced us so much from the source of our food supply, how it gets to uh, from the farm to your table. Uh, a lot of people just, you know, uh, go into the grocery store, buy what they need and leave. And that's what it's been for generations of Americans. Um, and so this some sort of out of sight and out of mind mentality has allowed this this I guess you could call it incompetence. Maybe it's planned incompetence to intentionally make the food supply chain weak. I guess it depends on how conspiratorial you are. You know, there, I guess there's different ways of looking at this. But I think it's really important to consider just how, uh, you know, this 
this day of reckoning, as it were, um, you know, it, it, uh, has really, you know, uh, been in the cards for a long time because of the insane policies that have been pursued by the U.S. government. Yeah, absolutely. It's this, you know, people are used to going to the grocery store and seeing this multicolored assortment of, of vegetables and fruits from all over the world. And I, I would absolutely say that it's by design, that, that it's that it's actually part of the transhumanist plot to divorce people from their food and from the land and, and their relationship with nature, the cycles of nature. When you when you just go to the plastic store and you buy these prepackaged processed foods, you just you, you don't you don't appreciate that. And you're disconnected from um, from from nature and reality. And that makes it very easy to you know, further all the rest of the fourth industrial revolution agendas on people when they're just lost like that. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I honestly think transhumanism is the logical conclusion of uh, the, I guess it's been around a couple thousand years, the mentality that nature is something to be feared, to be dominated and controlled by man, uh, and that there's no way to live in harmony with it. It's something to, uh, you know, bring to heal, uh, not something to learn from. Uh, you know, so I think a lot of these, uh, you know, uh, very avid <laughs> transhumanists, I have uh, meaner words for them in my brain, but I'm trying to be <laughs> uh, professional. But they, uh, you know, I, I think they have the same mentality that they view the, the natural as as bad or wrong or scary and are looking to control it. And, and they think they are able to direct the course of evolution in a better way than nature can just because of this uh, longstanding uh, ideological uh, viewpoint that's been perpetuated by a series of uh, religions and, and governments. It was, you know, in colonialism too, um, among among other things. So I think that's a really important point to bring up. And speaking of these transhumanist people, uh, not only do they want to uh, put a bunch of stuff in your body that doesn't belong there, uh, they also want to put a bunch of uh, things that don't belong in, in agriculture as well. Uh, so uh, it might be worth talking about the solutions that uh, the elite want for these uh, supply chain issues, particularly with the food supply chain, things like AI powered farm equipment, uh, genetically engineered uh, meat for some, uh, or in the sense of gen genetically engineered livestock, so you're still allowed to eat beef, but it's special, uh, and then lab-made food for others, uh, among others. So um, what sort of solutions have you seen uh, being sold to the public the most recently, and which ones alarm you the most? Oh, that's that's a huge question, and you're right that it, it spans it runs the gamut. So even before seeds, you know, you've got Bill Gates with his new Ag One initiative, and this is basically working with the Rockefeller uh, Foundation on sort of the Green Revolution 2.0. And their goal there is to literally go out to all the indigenous populations and and suck up. I mean, it's no coincidence that Bill Gates is one of the big funders behind the Seed Vault there in Norway, and so mm -hmm. that the goal is to inventory all life on earth and suck in the genetics and sort of look at what works well and what might work well during a drought over there or what can weather the storm over here and then use CRISPR editing technologies to create this artificial life, right? Of course, because we're we're not just taking ownership of God's creation, we are defiling it. And as you said, we're, we're better than that. We're going to improve upon that because we're technocrats and we can do that. Um, <laughs> and so we're going to take all the DNA of earth and catalog it all and then both in terms of seeds, where the Ag1 initiative says we're going to CRISPR modify our seeds and then we're going to um, pass out these GMO seeds to these backwards small peasant farms around the world because they just they don't really know what they're doing. And, you know, in the era of climate change, probably they're going to need some help to get through. So it's really incumbent upon us. And that's where we're going to throw hundreds of millions of dollars at this new initiative to accelerate the deployment of technology driven agricultural solutions to these peasant farmers and indigenous practitioners around the world. Um, and it's it's really a, a crime because these are, I mean, in some cases, hundreds of generations of, you know, indigenous farmers who've been passing on seeds from their, um, from one generation to the next. These seeds know where they're grown. They, they have grown up with part of the culture. So it's, it's really terrible. This is more about divorcing humanity from where we come from. But uh, so that's going on. That's at the seed level. Of course, the idea of cataloging all DNA and then using GMO modifications to create new disgusting Franken foods also extends into the protein space, into the meat space, like you mentioned. Um, another of the sort of the portfolio companies of the WEF technology pioneers last year was one of these companies that is doing the exact same thing, but on on that animal vector. So we're going to go out and we're going to take, you know, platypus DNA and then we're going to look at whatever penguins and maybe like cheetah and maybe 
you know, you could never actually buy this in a restaurant right now because, you know, animal rights and blah, blah, blah. It's not humane. But uh, if we just take their DNA and we synthesize this, we use some CRISPR tech and we merge these two things, maybe throw some jellyfish in there, too, so it glows in the dark. Who knows? It could be, you can get a really cool restaurant experience if your food glow in the dark and you'll, you, you wouldn't believe the mouthfeel of this new technology uh, fake meat that we have for you. So th- those are the kinds of like marketing speak that they're layering on top of this disgusting chimeric <laughs> grown in a, in a uh, you know, it's, yeah. it's disgusting, right? It's grown proteins in a, in a uh, bioreactor of, of nutrients where they just inject these, um, this DNA and then let it grow out into a piece of meat. So that's well, pretty nasty. Especially the role of CRISPR here, uh, I just find so insane because it's been coming out more and more studies showing that, that CRISPR like leaves a bunch of unwanted mutations, causes permanent damage that you can't fix. Um, and the idea of doing this at the seed level or really at any level, you know, you're basically, I mean, it, it's uh, uh, definitely seems to me to be abusive life <laughs> in, in general. Um just just totally yeah. insane. But it's no coincidence that if they're trying to do this to people, they're trying to do this to animals, they're trying to do this to plants and really um, pretty much everything. No doubt. Yeah, we will defile, we will supplant all of God's creation. Yeah, and uh, I believe the language I saw used there was CRISPR isn't exactly as much of a scalpel as it is sort of a shotgun. So we have, we have <laughs> yeah. very little control over the over the results we're getting here. Uh, but but hey, we're, Whitney, we don't want to hear about that. We're technocrats. We're, we're creating new Franken foods for you. We're going to tag them. We're going to put spores and uh, smart dust. Or you know, they have, there's there's a few different ways that you've heard. Some of them are also World Economic Forum technology pioneers. Uh, there's this one company that that is able to track the microbiome so they can look at exactly like the bacteria and the spore profile that you give if i gave you a cucumber you can look at exactly the the kinds of bacteria and fungus oh. and <laughs> spores that are on it and they can trace it back to the field where it was grown based on this so they already have really impressive providence in terms of tracking vegetables back if you have a black market vegetable they're going to be able to find you starbucks is actually piloting that out as a way to they say uh bring you closer together with the people that grow your coffee or whatever um right yeah uh claiming that you can figure that they'll use this this technology to figure out which which field it came from but it's interesting because starbucks has routinely been in trouble for basically using slave labor in this technology uh the system they're piloting and in that case would actually enable them to cover that up more (laughs) uh by by preventing actual people from going to see the the farmers and having it all mechanized and AI driven and whatever, uh, really crazy. Starbucks is also involved in the Operation Warp Speed vaccine rollout too, which makes sense for a coffee company. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, <laughs> not to get too off topic. <laughs> no, you're exactly right. They they do want to, and you see this both from private companies like that, sort of pitching the. This is why we're going to put coffee on the blockchain, is so that you can you know tack and trace each individual coffee bean back to make sure that it was actually fair market or fair trade, and now you can you can rest assured that your coffee came from fair trade fields <laughs> from properly compensated people. Yeah, oh, yeah. Trust Starbucks AI to tell you the truth. That's that's good. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, we sort of hit like GMO plants, GMO meat, and then the idea that the, the, all of this feeds into the fourth industrial revolution, complete awareness over the blockchain driven with AI of all resources and all economic activity on the, pl- on the planet. Um, this isn't just sort of the Internet of Things. It ties then into uh, the Internet of Bodies and like the health, you know, this whole around the pandemic, the rollout of the medical martial mm-hmm. law sort of super state uh, where they want health outcomes to be tied to what you eat. And we saw a lot of this language really rolled out for the first time in the Rockefeller Foundation's Reset the Table document last year, where they started talking, you know, not just about, yes, we want a racially equitable food system, sort of the stuff that we would expect from the Rockefeller, but they're really all of a sudden keen. You know, after a hundred years of saying it doesn't matter, there's no nutrition, it doesn't matter, just eat whatever, you know, focusing on caloric production of, of f- foods, they sort of did a mea culpa and said, uh, we were kind of wrong, sorry. It turns out it does matter what you eat. And so now we need to, now that we've got this medical martial law state, we need to extend that into food, food production, and diet of what you eat. And we're going to take control over all of it. And so we see yeah. uh, prescribing certain foods. There's like a prescription for broccoli is one idea. But of course, that just like the smart drugs that have little transmitting devices in them and will report on you if you don't take your medicine on time, uh, these foods will do the same thing. So it's going to be able to track and trace that individual um, piece of broccoli, not only from their apparently fair market, fair trade farm in Peru or wherever, uh, back through your body and then into the smart sewers, which you've also talked about in the past. Yeah, so I was – 
I, I was just going to bring that up because the, the smart sewer system that was uh, announced and is being rolled out currently by HHS under, uh, I think, a majority, actually, uh, of U.S. cities um, is supposed to surveil the wastewater for COVID-19, they say. Uh, but actually, the people that were contracted to do that uh, came out of MIT's uh, smart city lab, Sensible Cities, uh, I think they call it. And the original purpose of that was to allow uh, local city planners uh, or, or whatever to analyze people, the, the community's diet, and make a policy in accordance with that, like increasing taxes on foods that people are eating too much of, um, among other things, and potentially uh, banning some foods or promoting some others and what, uh, what, what, you know, what have you, basically paving the way for the government to uh, mandate what people can and can't eat. Very slippery slope, considering that they're already basically setting this up. And it also has a war on drugs component as well, because they also have piloted it uh, with the NIH before for targeting, um, trying to see who is uh, using opioids in, in high amounts in various parts of the of the United States. So definitely a multi-purpose op, but now they want to surveil what's going on inside of your body, including what you are ingesting, not just external surveillance anymore or what you're saying online or where you may be going. Uh, they're trying to take it to the next level. And actually one of the preeminent World Economic Forum thinkers, uh, Yuval Noah Harari, says that once – uh, surveillance and, and, and these objects are able to get on and in the body, uh, uh, on the body being, you know, biometric wearables. That is when the world will cross the line into the era of what he openly calls digital dictatorships. So take note, this is bad. Let's stop this, please. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, that was the BioBots creator. And one thing, you know, she did, yes. uh, she's saying she did mention the diet. You can watch dietary preferences around different demographics. They didn't mention, but other, again, other portfolio companies of the World Economic Forum have started looking at how to better understand the microbiome within your gut. Mm -hmm. And you get a lot of, so to speak, you get a lot of data from the sewers of that as well, because that's, I mean, that's what's coming out of us. So, um, so they're, yeah, they're embarking on complete surveillance within your body, uh, within the wastewater, and of course, from above as well. I don't know if we mentioned the climate tracing initiative, where Al Gore is marrying the data from all of these satellites that are going to be watching in real time for different uh, greenhouse gas emissions. You can tell if there's one too many plants being grown on your farm or one too many cows farting on this other guy's ranch then we can send the, the green piece on in there oh that's weird because don't plants absorb carbon dioxide and produce oxygen yeah, you, <laughs> so once again it is the exact opposite <laughs> of the way you think we should be going here but that's again that's what, what i'd like to say there is if it doesn't seem like what they're doing is making sense if it doesn't seem like they're actually helping it's because that's not their goal their goal is complete control right and you have to adjust your lens to see that and then this all makes complete sense yes that's absolutely true because like uh we i mentioned earlier in the intro there's all this talk of an imminent cyber attack on food supply chains and other supply chains, but then the same effort by the same people making this warnings to get all of the all of that supply chain hooked up to the cloud um, or to AI or or something like that to an extent that we can't even really imagine right now. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and if they're so susceptible to these cyber attacks, then why would you uh, impose that as the solution? Well, you know, it, it makes sense when you look in a little more into the motivations of these people that often the crises they warn about are the exact catalyst they need to uh, expand and fully implement the quote unquote solutions they're offering, but nobody wants. Um, and so they can sell it more to the public in a time of, of major crisis. You know, we've seen that. Pretty recently, and it seems like we may see it again. But on the case of AI and, and farming, there was actually an article out today uh, in Forbes called AI's, quote, noble role in agriculture, powering transparency in our food supply chain. Uh, just one of um, many recent articles promoting this uh, in case people haven't uh, seen it when they've been scrolling through different news feeds or, or whatever people use to access their information. Um, but it says things like uh, the pandemic related supply chain crisis demonstrates the need for real time connections between producers and consumers, which is really silly when you think about, well, wouldn't it the best real time connection between producers and consumers be like local farmers markets or something like that? Instead of, you know, I guess by <laughs> yes. real time, they're like, ooh, instantaneous instead of like three times a week. 
uh, down the street or something like that. You know, uh, it's instantaneous and on your phone. So, you know, right away, you know, uh, it, it seems like that's the type of uh, convenience they try and sell it and not having people really think through um, how these things would work out in practice. But I mean, this article is pitching AI from everything from uh, monitoring and setting up irrigation, uh, detecting soil conditions, uh, tracking how crops are growing and developing, um, harvesting, uh, really everything that is currently done by people really uh, is uh, these guys want it to be done by artificial intelligence. And of course, just like they did uh, with GMOs, uh, they go in and they say, oh, it's going to make uh, your crops more productive. It's going to save you money. You're going to be able to produce more food and make more profit. But then the opposite happens. And these people are, you know, end up being these farmers, whether it's in the U.S. or India, end up being trapped in, in debt cycles, losing their farms. And, uh, you know, the elite ultimately win because they get to take that land away, uh, buy it up uh, and, uh, you know, further consolidate control over the food supply. Yeah, very all of it. Very well said. And, you know, I was just looking up that article. It's it's goes only a few paragraphs down. It starts talking about precision agriculture. So, yeah, this is exactly part of that. It's it's not exactly going to help the farmer as much as it's going to afford the uh, the cryptocracy perfect data about every piece of lettuce growing on this guy's farm. Um, there's a lot of these people that want to use. Yeah, use vision and computer AI to track the crops. And um, and as you said, it's often the people that are um, thinking about these problems and creating these problems that then are there to capitalize on them afterwards. When you look at the cyber polygon exercise, it's not a coincidence that it's funded. One of the main partners on that channel, as they call it, is IBM, who's the one out there pitching their blockchain based supply chain solution for uh, looking at food or whatever across the supply chain at all stages and be able to track, you know, if there's a, a bad, you know, a, a salmonella outbreak on some lettuce, then you can track all pieces. This is the way they pitch it. You can track all lettuce back to it, its, its source and then let everybody else know that they should be aware of that. But, um, but yeah, they, it is they that stand to benefit from what would be a coming supply chain disruption due to a, a cyber attack. And, uh, and they're the ones writing the script. It's just, I mean, it was obviously the same on the event 201 side. So it's going to keep an eye on. Yeah, so what's crazy is that the World Economic Forum right now are not just involved in trying to um, basically uh, redefine one type of supply chain. They're trying to do it for every type of supply chain, and it's all involving blockchain. So I came across this when I was writing about the situation in Tanzania with the recent pretty suspicious death of uh, – of their last president, uh, their extreme involvement in basically redirecting uh, mineral flows and mineral resources, um, all these different uh, blockchain-driven uh, initiatives related to mining, and, and it's really comprehensive. Uh, I mean, obviously, the World Economic Forum has been around since uh, the early 70s, so they've had plenty of decades to plan all of this stuff out, I guess, and lots of funding um, and lots mm -hmm. of powerful backers, so I guess that's how they've uh, planned all this stuff out, but, uh, you know, they have a lot of the biggest corporations on uh, on their side, you know, one of the main companies that they back in their uh, mineral resource uh, supply chain efforts is Glencore, which is already one of the biggest, uh, if not the biggest uh, commodities companies in the world, uh, longstanding ties to Israeli intelligence, going back to its founder, Mark Rich, um, who was controversially pardoned by Bill Clinton his last day of office for his uh, role in, uh, you know, uh, illegal things benefiting Israeli intelligence, but were against U.S. law, among other things. So that's the type of people that the World Economic Forum likes to partner with. Um, but in the realm of... Um, you know, a uh, cyber polygon and cyber security. It's interesting that there are a lot of, um, you know, similar intelligence actors that do pop up there. Um, some of them you can see at cyber polygon. Some of them you can see at the World Economic Forum Center for Cybersecurity. Uh, one really obvious example is uh, that Center for Cybersecurity's head of strategy uh, was one of the main guys in Israeli military intelligence uh, for years, um, intimately involved in the development of uh, Netanyahu's cybersecurity policy and this effort uh, or this policy that began in 2012 that I've written about on, on several occasions about um, basically making front companies for operations previously done in-house by Mossad and other Israeli intelligence agencies. These fronts will then do it and they get embedded or bought up or acquired uh, by major Silicon Valley giants. The architect of that <laughs> is running the WEF Center uh, for... for um Center for Cybersecurity Strategy right now, which, of course, uh, that Center for Cyber uh, 
Cybersecurity uh, is uh, the part of the World Economic Forum that does Cyber Polygon, which is now going to be an annual affair until who knows when. Um, but, you know, 2020 uh, was the one that happened last year, and there's going to be one uh, this year as well. Something to look forward to, I guess. Uh, but what's interesting is one of the main partners in a lot of these initiatives related to cybersecurity with the World Economic Forum are big banks um, and financial services uh, specifically. Yes. But a lot of these guys are warning not so much, uh, well, they're warning not only of a, of a big hack on the financial system, but they're saying that in tandem with that, there's going to be big attacks on supply chains themselves uh, in, in third party suppliers of critical services. And of course, they're all pointing to solar winds on that, uh, which has not been investigated at all. Uh, for those that um, are wondering, they said uh, intelligence came out and said, oh, it was Russia likely, but they didn't provide any evidence and they still haven't. So uh, they clearly haven't investigated it, nor do they intend to at this point. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the CIA director, Bill Burns, had recently told the House panel uh, that, uh, China, of course, he blamed China, but he said they are uh, using cyber attacks and they can launch these attacks that are going to cause temporary disruptions to critical infrastructure within the U.S. And that includes grid outages and supply chain disruptions. Um, so even though we're talking, you know, of course, the World Economic Forum is a very public facing part of the whole thing. So that's why their name keeps coming up. But they're just sort of implementing the, the things that have come out of the Club of Rome and the United Nations and uh, a lot of these organizations for a long time now. Well, one group I, I've been uh, I'm going to be writing about in my my next article that's going to be coming out is called uh, the Financial Services Information Sharing and Analysis Center or FSISAC. And there's actually an ISAC for pretty much every industry. And most of them, if not all, uh, the ones that exist in the United States are part of uh, some of these shady cybersecurity partnerships that are either directly affiliated with the WEF or are part of a broader initiative that the WEF is running with the uh, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, uh, which, of course, also has a has a globalist flavor, uh, not a, you know, Car the Carnegie family uh, being not unlike the Rockefeller family in many ways, including the period of, of their rise to prominence, among other things. But there's definitely a lot uh, that this group is warning about uh, happening um, in over the course of this year. They released an, uh, a big report. Um, you can only get the summary unless you're a member um, uh, of this group. But they definitely have a lot of interesting warnings that I think um, are worth uh, taking into consideration, especially considering that a lot of these uh, the people that run this ISAC um, are basically some of the biggest people in uh, banking today. You have like Bank of America, Citigroup, uh, the biggest uh, insurance companies like uh, – uh, Humana is there. Uh, you also have Wells Fargo as a bank. You have a guy from SWIFT, which is critical financial infrastructure. SWIFT is also partnered with a lot of the other World Economic Forum stuff. And they're basically warning that sometime, you know, in 2021, another catastrophic, a catastrophic cyber attack is in the cards. They say the dominoes are still falling from solar winds and they have a couple uh, specific predictions about that, what that attack would look like that are also really similar to things that the World Economic Forum itself has been warning. And it's worth pointing out that this ISAC is directly partnered uh, with the World Economic Forum, uh, specifically their partnership against cybercrime, as they say. Um, <clears throat> but one of the things they say that uh, is likely to happen is ransomware that first start, start off in one small, in, in one country, but quickly scale up uh, to targets all over the world. So something that starts off small and sort of crescendos, um, implying that these uh, faceless hackers will be testing it out somewhere small and then expanding if successful. Um, but the main tactic they say they plan to use is, is ransomware and that ransomware as a service will evolve um, and involve uh, nation states at some point. And they, they further argue in a separate but related uh, prediction that nation states and cyber criminals are going to join forces to enact this, uh, this, this big hack uh, that they see as imminent. Uh, they don't exactly put a date on it, but their previous report didn't exactly frame it as being imminent. Uh, they say their concern about it being imminent is related to the increased digitization of everything over the course of COVID-19. But some of this, the claims they make in here are uh, very false, <laughs> like uh, their claims that uh, they, one of their predictions, for example, is that um, uh, economic drivers towards cybercrime will increase 
And this is them saying uh, that the pandemic and all of that has made a cybercrime more attractive uh, and that increases in cryptocurrency valuation will also uh, basically motivate people to conduct ransomware attacks to get uh, Bitcoin or some other sort of cryptocurrency, which also incidentally will pave the way to crack down on crypto at some point as a way to stop mm-hmm. these these hackers. And, and of course, the nation states listed in here, the only possible uh, culprits are, um, you know, adversaries of the U.S. that the past several years are the same cybersecurity companies that all have intelligence ties pretty much to either the U.S. or Israel all say it's either China, Iran, Russia or North Korea are the only possible nation states that would, um, you know, combine forces with, with cyber criminals. But um, on the point of uh, something being totally false in this report, their claim that cryptocurrency is is inherently related to crime uh, is really silly. Like uh, last year, despite the increase in, in everything becoming digital, the amount of um, cryptocurrency transactions used explicitly for cybercrime was under 1%. It was like 0.34% of all transactions, and that's down from 2%. In 2019, so they're obviously creating a problem out of out of nothing, or basically grossly exaggerating um, a problem. So, how much can we trust their other stuff, especially when they stand to benefit uh, from these critical systems collapsing? I wouldn't trust them at all. If that's the question, no, certainly not. And I, I mean, everything. It was quite a bit of data there. The one thing. Yeah, sorry, I, I do that. And- <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's why I love you. Um, it, it, one of the things I just wanted to like step back a little bit, and one thing that I thought was worth mentioning about the whole uh, cyber polygon exercise last year is that it was just such a production. You know, there was like this exercise yeah. there was a coding competition going on in the background that had nothing to do with what they were talking about. They just had some people come in from wherever to do little coding exercises, but it created wearing this... matching t-shirts, looking cool. Yeah, yes, yes. I and, and with cool lighting, so it, <laughs> and lots of monitors all over the place. So it's like they're just creating this ambiance of like cyber. They just want it's branding, right? They just want people to think that there's something going on there involving computers and security. And then uh, Klaus Schwab and the other managing director stand in front of that backdrop. They had a little like skybox. So while they were giving their their prepared speeches, you would look down and see all these people on you know doing hacking or whatever whatever they're supposed to be doing but that's that's and, and it was very clear as you watch their eyes go from right to left over and over as they give their statements that they're just reading off a script so the whole thing this whole cyber polygon event was really just a lot of companies paying money like IBM to get their name on something and to push blockchain solutions for the the problems they're about to create and the and then this production where they stand up and they read their scripts about the problems they're about to create in, in front of some people doing coding exercises it was just weird. It's just a weird thing to, to, to witness, period. Um, and that is actually very um, – it's a great example of sort of what you're saying, which is there's just not – there's not even truth to anything that they're saying anymore. It's just this script, this big production that they're enacting. They don't believe what they're saying either, but they know they've got to say these words so that the mass of people that really hasn't started thinking critically about what's going on just walks straight into their fourth industrial revolution, doesn't, doesn't question any of this stuff. Um, so I just want to sort of point that out that there's not a lot of truth to anything, even even the productions themselves now, the events. It's kind of like the climate summit this week where world leaders got onto Zoom <laughs> and read their speeches, right? There's no actual like diplomacy going on anymore. It's just a production at this point. Right, right, but, right. Um, mm-hmm. But I did, that's okay, a really so, good so, point, yeah. How how it's just moved to be more overt theater than before. Like they're not even real meetings. They're like these. Um sort of acted out, yeah, like scripted things, like you were saying. A lot of the stuff, the World Economic Forum has that flavor to me um, in general, because they're obviously so concerned about what people think about them. And Mm -hmm. actually, Klaus Schwab uh, earlier this year laid out the agenda essentially for this year, uh, saying, for example, that COVID would give way to climate change as the main uh, fear driver um, in, or, you know, a, a thing to be afraid of at the current moment, I guess. Um, and that's already, we've already seen that shift with Bill Gates' uh, book tour about now it's about climate change after he did, you know, several uh, related to COVID-19, uh, The Guardian saying we need lockdowns for climate change and all this other stuff starting in the months after Klaus Schwab said that. But one of the other things he emphasizes is that this is the year that we need to build trust um, and emphasize that over and over again because the World Economic Forum cares so freaking much about what people think about it. 
and they are very alarmed at the uh, eroding of trust in institutions. And I guess they thought they could come in and, and pose themselves as the solution to failing institutions. But I think people that are aware and angry about the failing institutions know that the World Economic Forum's involved. And so I guess maybe they didn't plan on that or something. So they're trying to build trust over the course of this year. And one of the main things they want to do is give the illusion of progress at some point. Um, you know, whether that's a return of a little bit of normalcy or, you know, some sort of um, big progressive um, policy is is allegedly implemented, but really it's sort of a way of advancing uh, the same agenda, the fourth industrial revolution, but they frame it as a big policy win, uh, you know, for uh, the people or something like that. He sort of set it up that way. But it's interesting to emphasize how interested they are specifically in 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 the trust of people right now, um, which is why it's so important to, um, you know, expose how shady they are and why they are bad. Um, but I think the scripted nature of all of this really reflects that, that they're trying to make it a big uh, production um, in, in a sense. But, um, you know, I think most people that actually watch this stuff see right through it. Yeah, I, I would hope so. But then again, most people don't even watch it. And so that's, yeah, it's, I guess it's that's for those true. people. I was trying to be optimistic. Those people that just sort of, <laughs> no, I'm with you. I just, I think, I think it's those people that aren't paying attention that would be like, oh, there's some guys in front of a computer talking about this uh, that would actually be fooled by them. Um, as far as like switching to climate, yeah, that's absolutely happening. And I just wanted to mention that like the banks are just as they're underwriting some of the things you were speaking to earlier, they're right there along with the absolute zero carbon agenda, forcing the shipping industry. Oh, man, yep. they are ready for carbon markets. They are excited. Yep. They've been excited for years. And, oh, man, the oil companies are the most excited Oddly, about that yep. stuff. There's your um, your climate saviors <laughs> right there. Right, with uh, the perpetrators. Just yeah, ex cool. just, with that, just as with agriculture, it was the same companies like Tyson and Cargill and Syngenta that have been buying up all the seed companies and all the family farms across America and merging and acquiring and turning into this big monstrosity and uh, installing these CAFOs where they shove all the animals in and just feed them full of antibiotics and do all these terrible practices. No one in their right mind would ever advocate that that's the right thing. Uh, and now they step back from it and they put the camera on it and they point at it and they say, this is disgusting. We have mm -hmm. to end animal agriculture. We have to take away your animals. So they create these straw men. They create the problems. It's it's one big Hegelian dialectic. Uh, and then they offer up their their control based solutions. I did actually before we go any further, I did want to mention that like some people might be wondering what does it even what does it mean when we say it's an attack, a cyber attack or a ransomware attack on the supply chain? And there was a good example not too long ago that actually there were a ton, but one that stands out for me was one on a company called Americold, which is the, the I think it's the world's biggest, but it's certainly the United States' biggest frozen storage company and logistics company. So I think the CEO said something like over 90 percent of everything you find in the, in the cold sections of the groceries goes through their facilities. So it's a massive, right? It's a massive wow. operation. Tons mm -hmm. of trucks coming in, tons of trucks coming out, pallets of cold food going into storage in this massive underground warehouse. And you, as, as, as they found out when their systems were attacked and went down – as it, it, I mean, there's not even like a buffer, Whitney. Like as soon as that happened, nobody has any sweet clue what's in that warehouse. Nobody knows where to find their products. They don't even own them. They're just storing them on behalf of people somewhere along the supply chain. But everyone out there who puts food and uh, frozen everything through their um, services lost track of their products for that day. And so trucks that were coming to get deliveries were suddenly just lining up. It's, I mean, it was instantaneous because they didn't know where to go find the the goods in this massive warehouse to put on the trucks. They didn't know where to put them when they were coming in. So they started sending drivers home, and that happened immediately upon their systems being shut down. And it took them, I think, 72 hours to get their, to, to start standing up new computers. They didn't even, they weren't even able to rescue their systems. They had to install their software on new, on new it's really a worst case scenario, install their systems on new computers and restore from backup. And that took 72 hours. And then again, it took some time to spin up and get those delivery drivers back up there and everyone know, you know people are pretty familiar with the idea that we have like a three-day supply in this just-in-time inventory system of groceries mm -hmm. and supplies and other places so that is i mean that there were people who experienced empty shelves as a result of what you know we're describing here as a pretty well-contained small scope attack so it's you can imagine from that 
I mean, this is really illustrative of how much of a Achilles heel this is in our supply chain. If you can attack one company, a cold storage company, and have effectively stopped deliveries to grocery stores across the Southwest, it's a pretty uh, it's a pretty telling situation. And so when you translate that to the idea of an internet wide or just something that affects multiple uh, logistics suppliers at the same time, then you see how we arrive at food shortages or an acute situation where people are, are going to those uh, stores and just finding empty shelves. That's a scary thought. Totally. And, and this is why it's so insidious that you're also at the same time, you're having all of this going on. You're having government specifically in the West trying to criminalize even more uh, small farms, family farming, even gardening in your own house or in your own yard. Um, and uh, you've covered a lot of this recently, like attacks on sustainable animal husbandry and the use of organic fertilizers, like uh, livestock manure, things that people have used for, uh, you know, forever, basically, as long as agriculture has been around and animal husbandry has yes. been around. You know, this is something that has happened. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's absolutely insane. But uh, if you wouldn't mind going over some of the uh, current efforts in the U.S. and elsewhere to criminalize um, those efforts and basically try and prevent people that want to be independent of this crazy, uh, fragile food system that they're openly saying is going to be attacked at some point. You know, um, could you go over some of those policies? Yeah. So the overarching theme is that they're making the case. And we talked a little bit about the Rockefeller Foundation sort of starting to indicate that now that we have a medical martial law situation and we're all, you know, a human health crisis worldwide, that we need to think more about food. And part of that is making the case that uh, farming and ranching is dirty and antiquated and there are these risks of zoonotic threats and we just we can't we can't afford Whitney to do it that way anymore. People died because we had farming and ranching. Even Fauci himself put out a paper last summer that said if you look back, you know, in the, in the abstract, it made this statement, which is just a stunning statement. It said the origin of pandemics in human history began when we started agriculture and animal husbandry. So he, even in that abstract, is blaming farming and ranching. <laughs> All right, send Fauci uh, to the jungle and see how he does. Yeah, Little turd. Exactly. Uh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and of course, we can still uh, sense this in the air when we think about the fact that they have clung tightly to their narrative about the the whole COVID situation stemming from a meat market, right? There's there's the connection right there for COVID to meat and food uh, being dirty and antiquated. But... Um, but yes, so that's the the theme is that they want farming and ranching to be dirty and antiquated. And actually, if you uh, if we have just a second, I want to read a quote from Joseph Stalin from almost 100 years ago, because just just to make it very clear that this isn't some new theme. This is actually like a tried and true communist tactic when there was a grains crisis, especially around Ukraine back in the day. He got up in front of the. Uh, Institute of Red Professors and gave a little talk about how are we, what are we going to do about this grains crisis? I mean, it's 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 exactly the same words we have today. It's a grains crisis now. It's a grains crisis then. Joseph Stalin took to the stage and said, the way out, the solution to this uh, grains crisis lies firstly in the transition away from small, backward, and scattered peasant farms to amalgamated, large-scale, socialized farms, equipped with machinery, armed with scientific knowledge, and capable of producing a maximum of grain for the market. The solution lies in the transition from individual peasant farming to collective, socialized farming. And so it's the same thing. This this appeal to it's communism. We're going to socialize everything, but this time we have science. This time we have technology, and we're going to do it right. We're going to produce a maximum of the grain. machines can do everything. Yeah. Yes, so. and it's it, this is exactly what we now hear from Bill Gates, who says we should all be eating 100% fake meat because it's just it's dirty and antiquated, and there's climate emissions from the cow farts, all these things, um, saying that we have to shut down farming and ranching. Uh, so well, I just wanted to sort of give that. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to bring up um, something I saw in one, one of your videos recently was this proposed law in Oregon that would basically prohibit people from basically having ranches at all. Um, based on how it how the text was, it was basically you're not allowed to uh, kill an animal for meat. It has to die of natural causes uh, for. And so obviously, like every rancher in, in the state. Uh, is instantly out of business if that's the case and becomes an an animal abuser. Um, and, and even people on a smaller scale, maybe you have a, a small farm for your family, 
you have a hand, you, you know, you have uh, chickens or something like that. Sometimes, you know, you, you kill them for meat or, or whatever. And especially if, you know, the current situation in the world advances and progresses anymore, some people are going to have to rely on that. Um, you know, you know, they're basically making that, um, a crime pretty, pretty mental. Um, anything else you want to say about laws or laws like that? No, you're exactly right. On a, on a more, yeah. So Oregon, it's sort of an extreme, one of the more extreme versions of it. And that's sort of what they'll do is they'll hit the low hanging fruit in terms of states that will actually go for these things. Colorado has a similar bill called the Pause Act. And that's actually on the ballot now that would do similar things. It would basically criminalize animal husbandry. And the idea here being you can still have pets. But you can only eat animals if your pets die. You can't raise animals to, uh, you know, to have meat. And so it's pretty out of control. I think, you know, the the Oregon flavor of this makes the case that animal husbandry is like sexual assault. And they, they sort of take an animal welfare approach to the whole thing, which, of course, everyone wants to give animals a good life. But to say that you're not allowed to raise animals ever again for your family is not how we do that. Um, I think it's more likely that, that we'll end up seeing more the tact that um, is going on in other places. Like in the UK right now, they were going around and confiscating birds and killing people's birds, gassing people's birds, because they were blaming a outbreak of bird flu at the poultry factory a few miles away. And so between bird flu and then on the pig front, there's something called African swine fever, which has been ravaging China and is now poised to go to the EU as well. Um, and so, all, again, all this tying to that idea, this basic theme that animal ranching is dirty and, and dangerous and ridden with pandemics, I think we'll see more and more people make the, and, and in fact, the, the uh, FDA has started putting out warnings that uh, people keep dying because they're keeping chickens in their backyard. It's like three people a year, but, you know, maybe you'll get an infection from your animals. And it's just for your own safety, we're going to have to take animals away. So I expect it'll be uh, the health vector that they use to take animals away. But even when they say that, oh, you can still have pets, that doesn't nece that's not necessarily true either because they're saying, for example, now, oh, you're going to get COVID-19 from your cat. You have to stay away from your cats now. Um, while also saying having pets is really bad for the environment. You can't have mm -hmm. pets anymore because they do so much environmental damage, specifically focusing on, on cats and that one too, because yes, cats do, um, attack birds and, and do other things and what have you. But a lot of it comes down to this, this, uh, technocratic plan to basically ration, uh, energy or calories or whatever to you and your family. And, you know, you have to have a much, bigger allowance to be able to include an animal in that, um, you know, in this, in this type of future, they're trying to usher us all, uh, into. So even if they're like, you can still have pets, uh, it's not going to be like that. They're going to try and basically make what was predicted in the Philip K. Dick novel, uh, that inspired Blade Runner do androids dream of electric sheep, where basically, you know, only the elite and only the rich actually are even able to be around live animals and everyone else has to, you know, just have a uh, robot animal pets, uh, or, you know, they, they only see when they walk around or go to places, animals that are inorganic and synthetic instead of actual and, and living. And that's basically, uh, seems to be not that different from what they're trying to create here. Absolutely. You're exactly right. Yes. It's, it's the othering of humanity and nature. So that's, you can see animals, they're over there. They're separate from us in the smart cities. And maybe you can get a picture of someone that's out there in the biodiversity corridors that the UN Agenda 2030 things carved out, but we're not allowed to go over there. We certainly can't live there or farm there anymore. We shut that all down, starting with a 30-30 plan that's already right, that's, that's out there now, Biden, paying farmers to stop forcing them and then giving them some money to stop farming. It's the same 30% of land being set aside for conservation and 30% of the waters is the same numbers that have gone in under Boris Johnson in the UK there. And, uh, and it's coming down from the UN. So yeah, so they'll gradually be moving humanity more and more into the smart cities using the zoonotic threat and all of these resource constraints. And, uh, yep, you're exactly right. Uh, well, what a future, huh? Uh, I'm not down for that, but you know, um, uh, I think something that uh, you're also a really good guest to talk about with are ways to resist these uh, agendas that we have outlined. Maybe not so much the cyber attack angle, but in terms of, uh, you know, how to um, be more resilient uh, in terms of your own food supply and things like that. Um, I don't know how much uh, we have about. Uh, 10 minutes or so, um, if, if you wanted to go over um, some practical things uh, people can do, including for people who may not be necessarily uh, 
not consider themselves gardeners or agriculturally inclined. Yeah, please. Um, that's awesome. The the good news here, and that's also you know one of the reasons I would say that the elite are so hell bent on shoving all of this, take the complete takeover of the food system, and doing it as quickly as possible, ideally before people even notice. Which again is why this conversation is such an important one. And thank you, is because growing food is something that we can all do. You know, if if it's a you know, I, I don't have any like solutions for the satellites in the sky monitoring us. I just don't have. You know, <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, can't I, throw I didn't a rock mean that, high or... that. Don't solve all the world's problems. <laughs> but exactly, but but food is one domain where one of and every one of us really can make a meaningful, impactful difference. Uh, so growing food is is not that difficult, or else humanity wouldn't have made it this far. It just mm -hmm. takes a lot of us right now, everyone hearing this conversation, ideally to go out and plant some seeds and then start saving those seeds. One thing that's really great about seeds is that they learn about where you are, about where you grow them. And so if you just buy some survival seeds and put them in the closet and wait, that's 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 really not going to do as much good as if you uh, get in the habit, for one, because you need the skills, but of of growing them out where you are every year acclimating them to your growing zone and uh -huh. to your soil and to your own climate and letting, basically letting them learn over the course of a few seasons how best to produce for you. And plus, they are so prolific that that means you are then, you know, at the end of this next season, positioned to share those better seeds with all of your neighbors as they start to realize, wait a minute, food prices have, you know, quintupled or whatever it is by then. Yeah. And, uh, and I need to be producing my own food. So, uh, again, everyone have, hearing this is a call to action. Everyone hearing this conversation it really needs to get involved with raising animals and uh, growing food and saving seeds. Even if you're in an apartment, there are amazing things you can do using systems like aquaponics and hydroponics just to start learning and start food production and get us through this acute period here. Um, and I've, you know, I've also talked to people who put little bags of soil on top of their RV. And I just I, I give those examples because I don't want anyone to say, well, what could I possibly do? You know, I talked to a guy earlier who's like, I've just got a black thumb. And so I really can't can't help. I'm not a green thumb kind of a guy. But uh, but every one of us can get involved here and uh, and should. Yeah, well, you know, even if you're not agriculturally inclined, I've always considered seeds uh, in and of themselves to be really, uh, uh, you know, excellent in terms of bartering uh, during a crisis or a long term crisis, especially especially when, you know, the World Economic Forum and these guys aren't talking just about shocks to the food system, but also the financial system. Um, these types of things that you need to survive to feed your family, things like that um, are definitely worth considering from the bartering perspective, um, like farm tools, not necessarily. Uh, that, that people will need or may want to borrow, things like that, too. Um, you know, there's different ways to think about this stuff. Even if you feel like you have a black thumb, uh, I would encourage you maybe to just, you know, learn a different style of agriculture that suits, suits your lifestyle or um, <laughs> uh, that's just based on my personal experience. Because some people may not know, but actually before I wrote, um, I was all about agriculture. That's actually why I went to South America in the first place. I managed a farm in uh, rural Peru uh, for about a year and a half, then worked in Cusco, and then made my way down trying to do small-time agriculture stuff um, with some people uh, in Chile, and then eventually ended up writing uh, instead, <laughs> uh, oddly enough. So this is definitely something uh, very near and dear to my heart, and I really encourage people uh, to get involved in this because, you know, the, one of the reasons I wanted to get involved uh, with it and why I ended up study uh, uh well I double majored but one of my majors was related to to agriculture and, and agricultural um ecology one of the reasons I was so interested in that was because I could see then how fragile the supply chain was and how no one I knew in my personal life had any idea about traditional skills uh, not just growing food but really anything no idea about how to produce uh, the things they need to survive. And so I, I didn't want to be like that. Um, but you know, you, you, if you've never thought about that stuff before, uh, you know, there's still plenty of time to even just learn a little bit. You'll probably, uh, be miles ahead of your neighbor. Um, you know, I mean, you, you don't really know, but there's really no point in, in, in waiting at this point. And the more, uh, knowledge we can arm ourselves with, even if you feel like you don't have a lot of space to garden or whatever. I mean, that in and of itself is really uh, valuable. And there's a lot of 
uh, books out there and a lot of knowledge out there. And, you know, what, what a lot of what we talked about today sort of um, focuses on this sort of war on indigenous agriculture and, and you know, I guess what to a lot of people to in the West today call permaculture, um, these, um, you know, longstanding agriculture systems that have deep ties to the land and the culture where they, um, you know, sprung up. I mean, we really need to uh, re redevelop those and resist the disappear the efforts to disappear um, and eliminate that type of knowledge. Um, so I think, you know, even if you don't have the space, you can still learn about stuff and maybe share uh, that knowledge with others, and it could be valuable as well. Yes, yes. Looking to regenerative agriculture is something that would actually uh, bring health back to the ecosystems that have been devastated by this last 80 years of monocropping at scale, mm -hmm. uh, rather than failing forward into more technocratic solutions and AI driven foods. It's just that that's not that's the opposite of what we need to do is follow these guys even further. But just to, briefly to, to sort of broaden the conversation, because the supply chain breaking down doesn't just mean food prices are going to rise. It means everything is going to rise in price if you can get it at all. And so I wanted to have how do you think about that? How do you get ahead of that? And I think the, the answer that I came up with that best encapsulates is, this is we all need to be moving away from consumption, away from that dependence on those supply chains in that system and into our own production, into our own mm -hmm. local economies. So if food is exploding in price, then, yeah, you can buy stored food. And, yes, you maybe you should. But it, even better use of your capital right now while those dollars still have value is to buy, like, like Whitney said, buy some tools for the garden, invest in that garden. You move your dollars not just into the food but into the production, the ongoing production of food. You use the same logic for lumber. Right now it's off the charts. Um, you could stock up on wood, I guess. It's kind of hard to store. But a better investment with that capital would be to buy a wood mill so that you can produce your own lumber for your community. You only need one of those, and there's usually some trees in your neighborhood. And as people need to build new things going forward here and they can't afford or maybe even find lumber, then that thing's going to pay for itself, right? Yeah, so you no. can be the producer of that commodity, and then you're not a slave to some job giving you dollars that won't even be keeping up with the price of commodities. You are the producer. You can think that way for everything. You can think that way for medicine. Okay, I, if I want to be able to grow my own herbs and make tinctures, you can become the, the neighborhood pharmacy. You can uh, think that way for eggs and other protein. If you have hens laying eggs and animals to raise – for honey, even we U.S. imports a ton of honey, more than you know, much more than we produce every year. And with these ships lined up and unable to dock off the West Coast, maybe it's time that you set up a few. I just did set up a few hives, and you can plan on getting 60 to 80 pounds of honey per year, depending on your nectar flow from each of those hives. And that means you're there, like you said, ready to barter, ready to give those things out to the rest of your neighborhood. And, uh, and then just keep going with that kind of thinking and maybe fabricating parts. We can't get replacement parts for tractors. That's keeping some farmers out of the fields, which is a terrible reason for us not to have food. But maybe you should get a 3D printer and stock up on some of that uh, resin. And then when you can, as people in your community need replacement parts or need other things for whatever they're building to become the new economy, then you're there ready to print those parts and stand up the new systems, the new local economies of the future. So that's one part. But then the other part, because we do know that these people are actively working to shut down animal all of it, to shut down agriculture completely and to shut down local economies. We have to be educating people and we have to be fighting. We have to be active politically and in any other way to make sure that people are aware of and working against these attempts to take over everything and to end all local economies and put us in this beast system. Yeah, for real. Uh, I mean, it's really crazy, the situation, and we really can't sit on the sidelines anymore with this type of stuff. And it, it's my personal opinion. You know, people ask me, especially since I've been writing about the, this effort to target the financial system more recently, you know, mm -hmm. asking me about like what's a, where there's, you know, uh, it, my opinion about where they should put their money. And I don't know why they're asking me because I'm not a financial advisor, but I do have my own like – personal opinion about that stuff and what I would, what I want to do for me personally. Um, and you know, this, these types of solutions we've been talking about is, is what I tend to favor mm -hmm. because whether it's crypto or fiat currency, um, you know, <laughs> at, at the end of the day, you can't eat it. Um, it, it won't allow you to subsist in and of itself as an, as an object. It only really has value because people believe it has value. So ultimately the best investment you can make if you have a ton of money is land, but you can of course, obviously scale that down to small things that will not just be necessarily ne uh, things that you will need in, in the event of this crisis, but that your community, your neighborhood will need and things like that. And, you know, uh, 
if that when that crisis hits, uh, things that you know uh, you would need in that time. I mean, it's worth investing in that stuff now in case your money is worthless at the time that you know mm -hmm. crisis comes uh, comes upon us. Whether you know you put all your money in fiat or your all your money in crypto or both are totally targeted or or whatever, you know you have something to go off of. So I tend to think that's the safest investment is something real and tangible that can help either feed you and your family or or keep things relatively normal um, in the event of a crisis in your personal life and things like that. So. Um, yeah, wow. Well, gotcha. with that being said, uh, thanks a lot for coming on. I think this was a really great conversation about a lot of topics that, that, that don't get talked uh, about very often at all. So with that, um, uh, I'd really like to ask you if you could please share with my audience where they can follow and find your excellent work. Thank you, Whitney. It's been my pleasure. Uh, the best place is iceagefarmer.com. I do still have a YouTube channel, but I'm not sure how long that will be the case. And I also post a lot of stuff to Telegram at t.me slash iceagefarmer. It's kind of the fire hose there. But again, this is a super important conversation. And thanks again for having it, Whitney. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, with that being said, thanks to everyone for listening and catch you next time on Unlimited Hangout.